standing ovation for this magnificent women's chorus. The men were here to clap, but I don't know that we stayed in rhythm or not. I don't think we did, but God bless you. You may be seated. Yeah. May, I, may I say it the way I feel it, please? I'll say it the way I feel it. Hollywood ain't got nothing on these days. <laughs> Ladies, you get to do it one more time. This is 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> in the movie, remember, uh, at the end of that, the camera in the movie, Sister Act, panned up to the balcony, and there sitting in the balcony was the Pope himself <laughs> in all of his finery, in his pretty white robe. What a great, great way to begin the day. So let your light shine. That's what Jesus said, right? If anyone ever says of you, she is the salt of the earth. He is the salt of the earth. You know what's happening, don't you? You're receiving a compliment. I think I'm right. She is the salt of the earth. There's a lot in that phrase, isn't there? A whole lot. Way deeper than words. So let me tell you some stories, alright? Bob Traeger was the very first member of this church that I ever met. I was still preaching at Hot Springs. And Bob drove all the way through the Ozark and Washita Mountains to hear me preach one Sunday, I guess, kind of like some of the Baptists do in their pulpit search committees. <laughs> Except in this case, when Bob got there, uh, the bishop and the district superintendents and the PPR committees and Judy and I had already made up our minds that we were headed up the road to Rogers, no matter what. So that Sunday morning in Hot Springs, Bob sat in the back of that cavernous church, way in the back by the windows. Bob sat there with some other faithful ones that he didn't know, and when he told them that he was visiting that day for Rogers, where I would soon be moving, their reception to Bob became quite a bit frostier. <laughs> but we chatted after the service. We enjoyed our first, our very first visit. And what kind of a person drives 200 plus miles just to meet a new pastor he doesn't know? What kind of a person does that. I was impressed, I'll tell you that. My heart was warm, I'll tell you that. He was the salt of the earth, Bob Trigger. And 27 years ago, this week, 27 years ago, I was asked to go to Mountain Home, Arkansas and preach the funeral sermon of Mrs. Iva Sanford McCormick, the preacher's wife of the pastor, the very first pastor, Brother Dean, to ever give me a full-time job in the church. I sat there in the chancel of that new church, aware of how over the many, many years, things had changed drastically for that congregation. The old church, you see, which was closer to downtown Mountain Home, had been sold and the entire congregation <coughs> moved lock, stock, and barrel outside the downtown area to a newer area of Mountain Home where the real estate, they said, was booming. And the new church building, where Iva's service was taking place, had a real ultra-modern look to it, with long banners hanging from the tall, vaulted ceiling. There were no pews anywhere. Everyone sat in 
individual upholstered chairs in the latest trendy color. And I tell you, you'd have to strain to see anything traditional about that place. But Ida would have loved it. She was what you call the salt of the earth, Ida was. She had that kind of flavor about her that enhanced everything around her, causing you then to appreciate more deeply those things she touched. And though she was a preacher's wife, she took it all in stride, found a great deal of humor in life that many might otherwise call mundane, bland. She could find some flavor in anything. She had a saltiness about her that was impossible, very impossible to miss. Like the time shortly after arriving at a new appointment with her husband, John, she found, Ida did, she found herself with a group of women in the church. One of the women who had brought her to the gathering as her guest saw another woman across the way who she had not seen in a long time, and the woman was in the process of explaining to her friend about why she had been absent, saying, oh, I haven't been to Sunday services in quite a while. I just don't like the new preacher. Standing right there beside her, Ida McCormick promptly extended her hand in greeting and said proudly, Hello, I'm Ida McCormick, the new preacher's wife. <laughs> I loved her saltiness. She was the salt of the earth. Jesus said his followers were the salt of the earth. And in saying that, he surely meant that they were to transform that which they touched, like salt is able to transform and lighten up things. Salt has to be one of the most common things on earth. What's that? It's salt. One of the most common things on earth. And you know this, smart people. In Jesus' time, before refrigeration, Salt was used to preserve meats, to keep them from spoiling. Salt was also used then, as it is today, to enhance and flavor foods. And in Jesus' day, simply eating together was oftentimes called sharing salt. Come over to my house, let's share salt together. You get it? And that expressed in that sharing the binding relationship that happened in those kinds of encounters with one another. Let's share salt together. Salt was also used in purification. Yes, so this multifaceted meaning, I think, might have been on Jesus' mind as he looked out on this crowd that is gathered in Matthew's Gospel called the Sermon on the Mount. And remember last Sunday, he called every single one of those who came blessed. That's the crowd. That's the one. That's the group he said, you are the salt of the earth, you blessed ones. You who are poor in spirit, you who are reviled and persecuted and misunderstood and meek, you're blessed and you're the salt of the earth, Jesus said. Or if you would prefer, why don't you try what Douglas Hare did at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary instead of saying salt and, and you know, Douglas Hare's pretty smart. He's written several books, Brother Scott Jacobson. You'll read one of them someday soon. Brother, Brother uh, Douglas said, you are the red hot pepper for the whole earth. <laughs> Douglas got away with it. Why don't you try? <laughs> In this same way, we're reminded that the statement from Jesus refers not to status, as if Jesus said, you are the world's ethical elite. No, no, nothing like that. But you are related to function. You must add zest 
to the life of the whole world. So thank God you added some zest today. <laughs> right? Did you notice some of the folks were singing along? <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Clapping, banging the wrong time, but yeah. <laughs> You're that zest for the life of the world. Well, let's be honest with ourselves, friends. In the midst of turmoil and pressure, it's easy just to be washed away, to be diluted down to such an extent that all your salt is gone. Did you hear me? With all the pressures that you're under and everything else that happens, it's easy to just be so diluted that there's no saltiness in you whatsoever. It's easy just to hide your light until the storms of darkness are gone. It is easy to do that. Jesus was often pressured to hide his light to keep him from danger, but he refused. He whispered one day to one of his followers to let her light shine. And he said, furthermore, I know this because she told me that he said that to her. She said to me that Jesus told her that we must sing victory in Jesus at her funeral, no matter what anybody said here at this church. And so we did that. And I do remember also the very first question that Mary Ann Hoppe ever asked me. It was in front of about 40 other people, and some of you sitting here today were there almost four years ago. I was just getting to know Mary Ann, and there in the home of one of her Sunday school class members, she was hosting this Get to Know the New Pastor dinner. We sat down for a lovely meal in a little circle after the meal and had a Q&A session. Nice questions came up, just sort of bubbled up. Judy and I were enjoying ourselves. How many children do you have? We have two. Love them a lot. Nathan and Tulsa, Haley and Austin. Where did you and Judy meet? Oh, it's a wonderful day. We met in Conway, Arkansas. And then I saw Marianne's hand go up and she asked this question. Do you drink wine? <laughs> what kind of question is that? You ask your new preacher in those very first few days in front of all kinds of people that you don't know very well yet. Marianne Hoppe. What a force to be reckoned with. What a powerful witness for Jesus. A child of Christ, redeeming, salty, and bright she was. Two things about salt in life. Both mix and mingle with their surroundings. You notice? They mix and mingle with their surroundings, salt and light. And so must we. Despite the dangers, despite the risks, we must mix and mingle with our surroundings. Both salt and light begin singularly, but they have an effect that's multiplied over and over and over again. Friends, you know these are metaphors. That's the fancy name for them. References that Jesus uses to declare something very, very important that he observes in the crowd gathered on the hillside throughout Galilee. You are salt. You are light. Did you notice what he didn't say? Be really careful because we can miss here. He did not say, try to be like salt. Nor did he say, study really, really hard and work very, very hard at being the light of the world. He did not say that. So don't, in your retelling of the story, don't misquote Jesus. He looked at this hillside congregation filled with all kinds of imperfect people, people who were hurting and often beaten down and made this very bold pronouncement to them, you are the salt of the earth. 
You are the light of the world. A city on a hill. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill, a double metaphor that Professor Boring at the Divinity School in Fort Worth says, reminds each and every one of us that we are the light. So don't try to be the light. Just be what you are. For you are the light of the world. Those who seem, there are those who seem, there are those who seem to be able to just light up a room when they walk in. If you know somebody like that, raise your hand. She walks in the room and just lights it up just because she walked in the room. Maybe you're sitting beside someone right now and he's that way. He walks in the room and just lights it up, yet hasn't said a word. There are those who carry with them a glow, an aura about themselves. They light up your life, it seems. And again, Dr. Boring reminds us of this. The disciples are what they are, not because of some inherent potential they're called upon to recognize and develop, but they are what they are because of Jesus' very word. You get it? So when Jesus whispered to Mary Ann Hoppy, sing victory in Jesus at your funeral, uh, we did, and she did have victory in Jesus. All of us do. Today's readings from Matthew's Gospel are challenging because sometimes we do get it wrong. We try harder to be salt, to be light, but instead we are salt and we are light. So just be mindful. I guess is the best way to say it. Be mindful and be aware. And do you know that this congregation, like many congregation congregations, has an opportunity to let its light shine in the midst of darkness, both politically and spiritually? We have an opportunity to just let our light shine, to just be the salt in the world that is becoming so strangely, strangely, distasteful, but we have an opportunity to be the light and to be the salt. And I'm glad that God has reminded us of our calling, lest we forget it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for that day long ago in Galilee, when you first Use these great references that ring true to us today more than 2,000 years later. And so we rise, Lord, to see what it means to be salt and light. And may we feel the strength of the Spirit and the strength of one another in our blessing one another in your love. In Jesus' name, amen.